Our first scripture text for today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23 and verses 13 through 25. May we hear God's word together. And Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city, and for murder. And Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, Crucify! Crucify him! And he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. I will therefore punish him and release him. But they were insistent, with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence, that their demand should be granted. And he released the man they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Here ends the reading of God's first lesson. Let us turn now to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. And again, may we hear the word of the Lord. And as they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. And they brought the colt to Jesus and put their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, during this time of year, many pastors and churches worry themselves about their services, their messages, their Easter worship, because they want to be sure to do their best. They want to be sure that their guests return. They want to do their very best so that other Christians, you know, the CEO Christians, you know what that means? Christmas and Easter only Christians will also want to return for the rest of the year. But I'm not so sure we should really worry too much about all of our efforts at Easter. You see, God does the calling and empowers his people to live the Christian life. All of us must choose, therefore, every day how much of our lives we're willing to give to the Lord, not just at Christmas and Easter. In fact, I have purposefully worked harder throughout the whole year to be sure that any message I give is just as high a quality a message as Palm Sunday or Easter. And did you know that even Jesus had CEO believers? Only back then they called them PPO believers, Palms and Passover only believers. But as willing as the crowds were to wave palms and cast them at Jesus' feet, By the time the Passover was over, they were ready to crucify him. In other words, they followed him with palms and Passover only. Jesus severely disappointed those crowds. Many of those PPO believers left. 
from following Jesus. And yet Jesus experienced a brief earthly triumph as he rode into Jerusalem on that colt on which no one had ever sat. Because within one week, most of the crowds had already changed their minds. So the question comes up, have we allowed Jesus a lasting victory over our lives? Or are we a PPO Christian? Someone who will throw palms for a while and follow him during a season like Passover or Christmas or Easter, but then leave. I don't want to be found fickle like the people of his day who allowed his triumph over them to be so short-lived. When I accepted Christ to be my Lord and Savior, it was for my entire life. It was for eternity, not just a day or a week. And so today's title, A Brief Triumph. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make your way into our hearts and lives today for more than just a brief triumph over sin, but forever, that we might always call upon you as Lord and Savior and follow you wherever you might lead us. Lord, may this message help us to make a greater commitment to you that we give you our all that we turn over everything in our lives to you, for we pray in Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, in Mark's account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, we learn that there were two crowds of people who were shouting and praising him. Those that went in front, he said, and those who followed. Matthew also, like Mark, distinguished between these two crowds. John also informs us that there were indeed two crowds. But why were they so careful to indicate that there were two crowds? Well, one had assembled in Bethany to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and this was the crowd that started following him on his way to Jerusalem. The other crowd came out from Jerusalem, and that crowd came to meet him because they were all excited about his triumphant entry and possibly establishing his kingdom as the Messiah. And so as they got the word that Jesus was approaching the city gates, they put a lot of hope in him and they came out to meet him. And so from Luke 19, 37, we read that these two crowds joined as one near the top of Olivet, which slopes down to Jerusalem. And it was here that their shouts began arising and continued to acclaim Jesus as the Messiah. What a frenzied climax to this earthly ministry of Jesus. This was his grand moment of triumph. Now, the people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah had very good reasons to do so. Some people had not only witnessed his miracles, but they became aware of the fact that he was fulfilling biblical prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. And some earlier prophecies, some people already were aware of. But there were many, many examples. I'd like to share some of these with you that the people would have been aware of at the time. The virgin birth was one of the earlier ones. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come unto thee, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, leaving Egypt, returning to Galilee, Hosea 11, 1. I called my son out of Egypt. Speaking in parables, uh, Psalm 78, 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee lowly and riding upon a donkey, upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then after his triumphant entry, Jesus fulfilled other prophecies that people realized only later. The betrayal of a close companion, Psalm 41, 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, whom I did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. The thirty pieces of silver, Zechariah eleven twelve. So they weighed out for my price thirty pieces of silver. 
Jesus' crucifixion between two thieves. Isaiah 53, 12. He was numbered with the transgressors. Casting lots for Jesus' robe. Psalm 22, 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Giving vinegar to the crucified Jesus. Psalm 69, 21. In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Not breaking the bones of the crucified Jesus. Psalm 34, 20. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. The piercing of Jesus' side with a spear even. Zechariah 12, 10. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And even, of course, Jesus' resurrection. Psalm 16, 10 and elsewhere. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one. To see corruption. Of course, almost immediately upon entering Jerusalem, the people discovered that Jesus didn't behave much like an earthly king. People couldn't understand why he didn't just oust the Romans and establish his kingdom right then and there. But he did focus upon something. He focused upon the Jewish corruption in the temple. And so when Jesus purged the temple of the entrepreneurs who were making money on the average worshiper, there was no doubt that some people were glad. No doubt the people who had been taken in by the exorbitant prices of sacrificial animals didn't mind Jesus cleansing the temple. No doubt the people who had to deal with the money changers and exchange currency for a price smiled when Jesus dumped over the money changer tables. And no doubt Jesus upset the system and infuriated the Jewish leaders when he said, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And notice Jesus called the Father's house, My house. The scriptures say that when the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, they began looking for a way to kill him. Jesus' teaching was simply powerful and amazing. And the Sanhedrin feared that their influence among the people had waned. They feared that Jesus would draw many people to him and thus rob the Sanhedrin of its standing and authority. They saw Jesus as a dangerous rival. They knew that something had to be done secretly and behind the scenes because they weren't dumb. They knew they couldn't do anything against him openly because the crowds would have turned against them. So Jesus faced opposition from three elements of the Jewish religious establishment at the time, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. These groups made up the Sanhedrin, the high court of the Jews. And they would have arrested Jesus on the spot, but his popularity among the people prevented that, at least for the time being. Their only hope, therefore, was to make Jesus look bad to his followers. That's why they asked him all these questions of which it might uh, hurt his ministry. Or they could arrest him secretly and try him illegally. Only by these methods could they take him down. And they did both, in fact. Suppose we should have a debate right this moment concerning the difference between these Jewish religious traditions and Jesus' teaching. Who was correct? How would you decide? If you were there and you heard Jesus speak and the Sanhedrin speak, how would you decide who was right? I know that in Jesus' day, there were ample support for both sides because they don't have the luxury of looking back at the New Testament. And so to many people, Jesus' opinion was just that, an opinion, just as it is today for a lot of people. Reality is merely decided by opinion in many people's minds. Like Pilate pathetically asked of Jesus, what is truth? You decide what truth is. Of course, that's not reality. So the Sanhedrin was powerful and influential. They used fear to keep people in line. They worked behind the scenes to accomplish their goals. They schemed and plotted. They twisted Jesus' words to win their case. Their opinion was against him. They didn't care what he taught. They didn't care what he was representing. They didn't care about his ministry. They didn't even care about his miracles. 
In fact, they purposefully quoted him out of context to make him appear to be a lunatic or a heretic. And it sounds exactly like what's happening today in our media. And many people are falling for it. So Jesus, on the other hand, was very convincing and spoke openly with great authority. But he was also humble and sincere. He spoke honestly and showed no partiality. He was not very politically savvy, however, or charismatic in his leadership style. He did nothing anonymously or under the table. He plotted against no one. So to get back to our question, if we ignored all the theological opinions between the Sanhedrin and Jesus and just focused on their techniques and methods, I think it would be easy for us to still discover the side of God. You see, the side of evil will always cause doubt and twist words around like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say thou shalt not eat of the fruit of this tree? Did God really say you will surely die? The same holds true in churches. When people try to promote doubt or fear, they are very likely working for the wrong side. And like the Sanhedrin did during Jesus' hasty midnight trial, evil will almost always do things secretly and quietly. It will bend the rules to suit its cancerous purposes. The Sanhedrin were concerned with doing things correctly only if it helped their situation. They railed in private against God's anointed. They ignored any truth that ran counter to the flow of their own culture and tradition. They had their minds made up and not even God himself was going to change it. And that's why when you look at different theological positions and opinions, you can sometimes figure out and find the telltale signs of truth and error just in the behavior of the adherents. That alone will tell you. If you're somehow not sure of what is right or wrong or what the scriptures teach, then just look at the methods. Just look at how secretly evil tends to do its work and masquerades itself as good and compare that with how boldly truth is illuminated for all to see and for anyone to simply reject if they choose to do so. I submit to you that if we had been living in Jesus' day, the pressures of these religious, organized, and political groups against him would have been very convincing to us. During his illegal trial, which we probably never would have heard about, he could have been rescued. The witnesses didn't agree. And we might never have known that. We might have been duped, I think, by the Sanhedrin. As many people are being duped today by the media into demanding an innocent person's crucifixion. Would we really have asked ourselves, wait a minute, less than a week ago I called out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, or would we be now embarrassed and scared? Would we have remembered at a crucial moment of decision during his trial that we had called out, Hosanna in the highest, or would we be moved by self-preservation no matter the illegality of his trial. Would we have remembered Jesus' divine and sublime and truthful teachings after his condemnation? Or would we have been more persuaded by the powerful forces of the religious and political leaders and their laws? Malcolm Muggeridge wrote, Jesus fulfills all the procedures of the prophecies, duly riding into Jerusalem on a donkey to the plaudits of the multitude. Only his victory lies in defeat, his glory in obscurity, his acclaim in ridicule. Why? Because his victory was only temporary for many, many people. He was on a donkey one day and on the cross the next. Friends, these truths are not unlike the temptations we face every day in life. You and I are constantly required to hold to Jesus' teachings regardless of the political uh, climate of our day or the ridicule we might face because of it. We will often be challenged to remember his truth as opposed to the powers that roam the earth seeking someone to devour. We will be challenged by covert forces to undermine the bold ministry of Christ among us. 
And thus we must give the Lord Jesus complete and lasting triumph over our lives. We must not be like those fickle crowds of his day who allowed his triumph to be so short-lived. In less than a week, they had changed their minds about him because of the political and cultural pressures. If we have allowed Jesus to ride triumphantly into our lives as Savior and Lord, will we later crucify him afresh by our disbelief? Will we crucify him afresh by our sins or by clinging to the opportune winds of political security? You and I need to ask ourselves the question, how long will Jesus' triumph last in my life? How long will I allow him to be king? How long will I shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Do we take back his authority over our lives within a day or week of coming into his temple, the church? If we are living sacrifices, do we ever crawl back off the altar to sacrifice him instead? You know that in actuality, true triumphs are God's triumphs over us. Those are true triumphs. His defeats of us are our real victories. When he defeats us, we are in victory. There is an unusual account of how the news of the Battle of Waterloo reached England. The word was carried first by sailing ship to the southern coast. From there, it was relayed by signal flags to London. When the report was received at Winchester, the flags on the cathedral began to spell it out. Wellington defeated. Before the message could be completed, however, a heavy fog moved in. Gloom filled the hearts of the people as a fragmentary news spread through the surrounding countryside. But when the mists began to lift, it became evident that the signals of Winchester Cathedral were really spelling out a triumphant message. Wellington defeated the enemy. And so in the fog of life, the enemies of Christ seem to be triumphant. Christianity is a failure, they say. And the church of God herself looks on in pain at her shortcomings. But lo, at length, from the very heart of the shadows, appears the majestic figure of Jesus. His countenance is as the sun shineth in his strength around whose wounds in brow and side and hands and feet, those wounds which shelter countless thousands of broken hearts are healing rays. Jesus had a brief triumph on this earth, and we can praise God that ultimately his triumph over sin and death was eternal. He conquered the forces of darkness and will come again at a time of the Father's choosing. Only next time that Jesus arrives, he will ride the white horse of victory with a sword of truth in his hand. And all that is hidden and secret will be revealed. And so therefore the triumphant Christian actually does not fight in his own strength for victory. The triumphant Christian celebrates a victory that's already been won upon the cross. There are some defeats more triumphant than victories. Jesus' defeat in death was more victorious over sin than his brief triumph in life. Jesus uttered a triumphant cry at the end. It is accomplished. And it was as though he had said, everything has begun. May Jesus ride triumphantly into your life and mine. And may we shout every day in our hearts as we follow him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To God be all the praise and glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we open the doors of our hearts and minds that you might ride triumphantly into our lives, that you might be Lord and Master, our Messiah, that you might deliver us from evil, that you might oust sin from our lives. And so, Lord, do so. And we give you all the praise and glory. May we always remember that we are to follow you. And either the crowd before or the crowd after that follows Jesus. We want to be part of that great throng of multitudes. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, that Jesus might always win the victory over sin in our lives. 
and that we might be cleansed even as the temple of God is cleansed through your work alone. My Lord, forgive us and use us. And may this message be one that brings salvation into the hearts of your people. In Jesus we pray. Amen.